Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and in all our dangers and necessities. Fill our wants and needs. Defend us with thy mighty power through the merits of our conquering King Jesus. Amen. Well, we're with uh, Dr. Christian, I'm sorry, Dr. Millard Erickson's Christian Theology. Page 48, he's discussing the relationship between theology and philosophy. He's spoken of Tertullian's approach, no connection between philosophy and theology. He tries to make a case that Augustine had platonic influences and saw some usefulness to theology all the way out to Aquinas's theology of um, Aristotelianism. And then he's zeroing in on four uh, philosophies in the 20th century. Um, pragmatism, which is a uniquely American approach. Uh, rooted probably in John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism, existentialism such as Heidegger and Boltman and his crowd, analytic philosophy, that's the school of philosophy I was raised in, in undergraduate school with all analytic guys out of Harvard, all Harvard PhDs, or 10 of them in our department. And then process philosophy, I've had the grand misfortune of having to endure Episcopal sermons that were acts of cruelty, giving us Boltmanian pablum process theology for one of the Sunday school curriculums that I was forced to teach by a command chaplain, Episcopal chaplain. So I did. We taught how crummy I was. God's in the process of becoming Anyways, we're with analytic philosophy now, the third of four 20th century philosophies. There's always been an element within philosophy which is concerned with getting at the meaning of language, with clarifying concepts, with analyzing what is being said and how. Socrates in particular was noted for this. He pictured himself as a midwife. He himself did not give birth to ideas. What he did instead was to lead others to the truth by helping them to discover it. In 20th century, this task was taken on in a systematic fashion. Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore in particular were early, pra early practitioners of analysis in the modern sense. Philosophers in the past had attempted to make pronouncements on a variety of subjects. What is right, what is true, what is beautiful. In modern times, however, philosophers have adopted a much more, much more modest goals. In part, this is due to the fact that a number of these areas are now in the domain of special sciences. <clears throat> now, philosophers focus instead on the meaning of language, the clarification and illumination of the goals of language, and of the means by which it achieves those goals are the task of philosophy. Instead of having a special subject matter, philosophy is concerned with the subject matter of all various disciplines, but in a special way. It deals with the language of ethics, science, and religion examining how it functions and how it signifies. Typical questions which philosophy is to be concerned are, what do you mean by that? And what kind of statement is that? This means that philosophy has come to be see, conceived as an activity rather than a theory or body of knowledge. Ludwig Wittgenstein put it this way, the result of philosophy is not a number of philosophical propositions, but to make propositions clear. There have been two major stages of analytic philosophy in the 20th century. The first was the militant stage, in which the philosophers were aggressive and even dogmatic. This was associated particularly with the label logical positivism, 
of movement, which grew out of a seminar conducted by Moritz Schlick at the University of Vienna in 1923. Names associated with his movement are A.J. Iyer, Rudolf Carnap, Carnap, Hermann Friegel, and the early Wittgenstein. This movement set up rigid standards of meaninglessness. I had a professor who was a Wittgensteinian, and uh, I took a course in aesthetics from him. And he had denied me attendance at a, for a seminar on Aristotle. It was a summer course, and I don't know, it was a limited attendance or what. But I was irritated, so that fall I took the course in aesthetics from him. Harvard PhD, Jewish guy. And he lectured away and had to write a paper, 10 pager. So I adopted all of his presuppositions. I forget how I argued it and assumed them to be so. And then drew the grand conclusions at the end that his lectures were meaningless. His PhD was meaningless. His life was meaningless. His paper was meaningless. The whole course was a waste of time. He gave me an A+. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do with your argument. Well, anyways, let's go on. Meaninglessness and Ludwig Wittgenstein and analytic philosophy. I had a more charitable supervisor for my honors thesis, which I did on Augustine, another Harvard PhD, on free will determinism. Fate, God, predestination. Oh, that was my paper. Got an A on that. According to this view, there are only two types of meaningful language mathematical logical truths in which the predicate is contained within the subject, such as the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. Two, empirical truths, such as the book is on the table. Empirical truths are propositions which are verified by sense data. There are only meaningful types, those are the only meaningful types of language. All other propositions, that is propositions which are neither mathematical type truths nor empirical or scientific type statements are literally nonsense or meaningless. They're actually pseudo propositions. So we have to talk to one another in mathematical equations, or we have to talk in terms of graphs and bars and, and the like. Anything else is meaninglessness. <laughs> so what you do is you do a reductio ad absurdum argument. <coughs> they fall into the category of expressive language like the arts. They express the emotions of the writer or speaker. The force of the statement, the universe is actually mental rather than material, is more like ouch or hurrah than it is like a book on the table. The language of metaphysics, ethics, and theology, and many other time-honored disciplines were consigned by the logical positivists to this status be seen from this brief synopsis that the logical positives were imposing a standard or criteria upon language. This led to the analysis of the termed ideal language philosophy, which set up the language of science as the paradigm to which all languages would inform, would inform, had to conform. And the, here there was a prescribing, a telling of how language should operate. So we can only talk to each other using algebraic equations and calcul differential calculus equations. <laughs> the second stage of modern analytical philosophy, however, the approach is quite different. Rather than insisting that language must function in a particular way to be meaningful, now philosophy tries to describe how language actually does function. It asks rather than prescribes, recognizing the narrowness of the earlier approach. The philosophers of the second stage observe the ordinary language used by people 
in everyday conversation, as well as more technical forms of language. Instead of insisting that all language must function in the same way in order to be meaningful, they ask about the different functions of language and type of meaningfulness inherent in each. You guys sit around philosophy departments writing and thinking about this stuff. This approach is turned ordinary language philosophy or functional analysis. Its aim is clarification. It seeks to untangle confusion by noting illogic and misuses of language. From the perspective of theology, analytical, analytical philosophy is not a competitor in the sense of offering an alternative view of reality or values. The philosopher is not a preacher with his own pulpit from which he makes pronouncements. And in the latter phase, analytical philosophy is not an opponent, ruling out theology's right to speak. Rather, it is a facilitator, helping theologians sharpen their use of words and avoid misleading language. Analytical philosophy then can be of immediate and obvious help to theology. There are certain problems with analytic philosophy, however. Rather than being merely descriptive, analytic philosophy tends to become prescriptive in subtle ways. To be sure, its prescriptiveness is not categorical, you must use language this way, but suggestive. If you wish to avoid confusion, do not use language in the following way. Yet the, the criterion of what is confusion and what is cl clarity are based upon presuppositions. At times, this tends to be overlooked. Analytic philosophy sometimes appears to draw too tarp to sharp a distinction between different types of language. Some language particularly theology, may participate in several functions simultaneously. A statement such as Jesus Christ is the risen Lord of the Church may simultaneously have historical, metaphysical, ethical, and expressive functions. Three, analytical philosophy is not a truly neutral tool, for it does not always guard against naturalistic assumptions, particularly with respect to the conception of the nature of language. It should not preclude language having supra-empirical reference. For there are areas in which we cannot be content with descriptive, non-prescriptive treatments. This is particularly true with regard to ethics. If philosophy does not contribute in some normative way. Peach? PJ? Well, let's press on to process theology. There's been a long debate over whether reality changes or is basically fixed in character. Heraclitus maintain that change is of the very essence of reality, whereas Parmenides emphasized fixity. Most philosophers have recognized both change and permanence within the world. Those who hold to a substantialist view have emphasized the fixed states regarding the changes as merely transitions between them. Others, such as Alfred North Whitehead, have seen the changes themselves as the key to reality. Whitehood, Whitehead is the father of modern process thought, although later philosophers and theologians such as Charles Hartshorn, John Cobb, and Norman Pittenger have given it greater visibility. Unlike the other three philosophies which we've sketched, process philosophy is avowedly metaphysical. While aware of the impatience of many modern philosophers with metaphysics, the process thinkers feel that their type of metaphysics is not as vulnerable to attack 
as our essentialist, substantialist, or idealist ones. Their central conviction here is that change is the key to the understanding of reality. In fact, that change is reality. The world is not basically made up of substances which change into one another. Rather, it is made up of dynamic processes. We are concerned not so much with things as with events. The divine reality participates in the reality of all else. Consequently, it or he is not a static, unmoved mover or changeless essence. It is, here's where that Sunday school material came in. It is a living, active, creative. The observation underscores a basic tenet of process thought. That reality is basically of one type. There's no dualism here, whether material or spiritual, natural or supernature, phenomena or noumena, or changing and unchanging. What is true of the whole reality is consequently true of each part. So it is characteristic. So the characteristics of God are those of the rest of reality in general. White Hood, Whitehead thinks the basic units of reality not as bits of matter, but as moments of experience. A moment of experience. There's always someone experiencing something. There is an interrelatedness among these moments. Consequently, each moment is a function of and related to everything else. Even history is thought of in this way. It is not merely a cataloging of past events. It is a living out of the past and the present. Thus, history is all the occurrences in the past as they are included in what is in the present. In a sense, nothing is ever really lost. It is retained and incorporated into what now is. Since the final units of reality are not persons or substances, but momentary states of experiences, I am a concrete new reality every fraction of a second. The I that is at this moment is able to feel a concern for the I that will be a year from now. By similar bonds of empathy, the I, as I now am able, to feel concern for future units are part of a series other than my own. <clears throat> Thus, while reality is not a fixed substance, it is not merely isolated individual moments either. Like the other modern philosophies, we examine their significant problems with process philosophy as well. What is, number one, the basis of identity? The connection between the I which now is and the I which was a year ago and the I which will be a year from now is not a substance of person. What is it? Presumably there's some basis for distinguishing what Hartshorn calls one personal series from another. But just what is it? Two, what is the basis for evaluating change? Philosophy seems at times to consider change per se to be good. But is it always good? Sometimes it is not evolution, but deterioration. On what criteria is such judgment to be made? In answer, we know that process philosophers do not insist that everything is changing. Values, for example, are not changing. But what is their na nature, origin, locus, basis, justification? That is a question that does not seem to be fully answered. To put it differently, what exempts these values from the change that is virtually everywhere? Three, is there no middle ground? between the emphasis upon change as the basic reality and the view that ultimate reality is static and immovable substance, number four. How long is a moment? Hartshorn speaks of our being different from the person we were a fraction of a second ago. 
And how long is this instant? Well, this is a reductio ad absurdum. It pinpoints a certain lack of precision and process thinkers. Theological uses of philosophy. At the beginning of this chapter, we noted the variety of relationships which can exist between philosophy and theology. What should be the role and place of the philosophy in our theology? I propose two basic guidelines. First, keeping with our fundamental presuppositions, revelation rather than philosophy will supply the content of our theology. Thus, revelation will be turned first to supply the major tenets of our understanding of reality. This will give us the basic framework with, with, within which our philosophizing will proceed. Our basic stance then falls somewhere between the first and second positions outlined above, which was Tertullian and Augustine. But I think he misrepresented Augustine. And while philosophy will be employed, there will be no c commitment to one system of philosophy as such. Rather, we will insist upon the autonomy of theology. Thus, the explication of revealed content will not be required to conform to any particular system of philosophy. Yet Christian theology has a definite worldview. The Bible quite clearly affirms a theistic and spe specifically monotheistic understanding of reality. The supreme reality is the all-powerful, personal, all-knowing, loving, and holy God. He has created everything else that is not by an emanation from his being, but by bringing it into existence without the use of pre-existing materials. Thus, the Christian metaphysic is dualism in which there are two types or levels of reality, the supernatural and the natural, a dualism in which all that is not God has received its existence from him. God pres preserves in existence the whole creation and is in control of all that happens in history as it moves to the fulfillment of his purpose. Everything is dependent upon him. And the highest of God's creatures is, like him, personal, capable of having social relationships with other humans and with God. Nature is not a neutral given. It is under God's control, and while it ordinarily functions in uniform and predictable ways that he has structured it, he can and does act within it in ways which contravene these normal patterns. With this as the starting point, the Christian theologian is to utilize the capacity of reason given him by God to work out the implications of this revealed body of truth. In other words, he philosophizes from the position or perspective created by divine revelation. In this respect, my position is close to that of Carl Henry who maintains that the biblical worldview is the starting point and framework for all intellectual endeavor. It agrees with Edwin Ramsdell and Arthur Holmes that Christian theology is perspectival. Taking the biblical concepts as the tenets of one's view of reality restricts considerably the range of philosophical worldviews that are acceptable. <clears throat> For instance, a naturalistic worldview is excluded, both because it restricts reality to the system of observable nature, and because possible occurrences within the system are restricted in conformity with its fixed laws. Materialism is even more emphatically opposed by the biblical revelation. Similarly, most idealisms are excluded insofar as they tend to deny the reality of the material world and the transcendence of God. Edgar, Edgar Sheffield Brightman has spoken of four main types of idealism. Platonic values objective 
its origin and meaning are more than human. Berkelian reality is mental. Material objects have no independent being, but exist only as concepts of the mind. Hegelian reality is organic. That is, the whole has properties which its parts do not possess. Ultimate reality is nothing but the manifestation of reason. Leibnizian reality is personal. Seem that the first type of idealism can be assimilated within Christianity. The fourth can, with certain limitations, be adopted by Christian theology. The second and third, however, seem incompatible with the tenets of Christian theism as outlined above. Perhaps the most compatible type of metaphysic is some form of realism, provided that it includes the supernatural dimension. The worldview here presented is an objectivism. By this is meant that there are objective measures that are true, good, and the right. The God who is the center of the worldview revealed in scripture is capable of emotion and action. Yet he is fully perfect, complete, and unchanging. There are norms and values that have permanence. Love, truth, and honesty are enduringly good. And they are because, so because they correspond to the nature of God. Thus, processed philosophy does not seem to be a viable alternative. The worldview here presented also regards truth as unitary, rather than there being one kind of truth in regard to scientific matters and another type subjective in matters of religion. Truth has something in common in all areas. Truth is a quality of statements or proposition which agree with the way things are. Even William James, the pragmatist, gives a similar definition of truth. Truth, as any dictionary will tell you, is a property of certain of our ideas. It means their agreement, as falsity means their disagreement with reality. Pragmatism and intellectualists both accept this definition as a matter of course. Logic is applicable to all truth. While some areas are clothed in mystery, and may therefore beyond, be beyond our ability to understand all the relationships involved. No, I, no areas are believed to be inherently contradictory. Coherent thought is at least communication depends on this assumption. Truth is a quality of propositions, not something that happens to them as a result of how we react or how they are used. Our second basic guideline is that philosophy should be thought of as primarily an activity, philosophizing rather than as a body of truths. It is potentially capable of functioning from any perspective and with any sort of data. The form of philosophy known as the analytical school aims at clarifying and refining terms, concepts, and arguments found in theology. We will make use of this discipline throughout the remainder of this text and give it special attention in chapter 6. Our primary use of philosophy will be to help us develop and employ certain critical abilities which are of value in all areas of endeavor. Number one, philosophy sharpens our understanding of concepts. Well, so does exegesis. Whatever the exact theory of meaning which we adopt, it is essential that we ruthlessly seek to determine just what we mean by what we believe and what we say. Progress in establishing the truth of ideas requires knowing precisely what we mean by them. Number two, philosophy can help us ferret out presuppositions behind an idea or a set system of thought. If, for example, we seek to combine two, more, two or more ideas that depend upon incompatible presupposition, the result will inevitably be internal contradiction. 
regardless of how appealing these ideas might appear. <clears throat> Philosophy can resolve the situation by searching out and evaluating those presuppositions. We need to be aware that there is scarcely any such thing as a neutral analysis or assessment. Absolutely. Every critique is made from somewhere. And the validity of the perspective from which such an evaluation is made must be considered in determining how seriously the evaluation is to be taken. We do well to consider any such assertion to be the conclusion of a syllogism and to ask what are the premises of that syllogism. Awareness of presupposition will make us more objective since presuppositions affect the way we view reality we may, may not be able to detect their influence, knowing that they are present and presumably operative, however, should enable us to compensate for their likely effect. This is the problem faced by a fisherman who's spearing fish. He sees a fish, and a natural reaction is to drive the spear into the water at the point where his eyes tell him the fish is. But his mind tells him that because of the flat fraction of light passing from one medium to another, the fish is not where it seems to be. The fisherman must consciously thrust the spear at a point where the fish does not seem to be. Similarly, a hunter at a moving object must lead it or shoot at a point where the target will be when the bullet arrives. Awareness of presuppositions means that we will be consciously, we will consciously adjust our perception of things. This is true both for our approach and our analysis at specific points. As a Baptist, for example, my background will lead me to weigh more heavily the arguments favoring Baptist conclusions in such areas as the doctrine of the church and must consequently require require what will seem to me excessive evidence for conclusions which fit my biases. Philosophy can help trace out the implications of an idea. Often it is not possible to assess the truth of an idea in itself. However, it may be possible to see what implications flow from them. These implications will then often be measurable against the data. The implication proves false tenets or tenet from which it logically derives will be false. For philosophy also makes us aware of the necessity of testing truth claims. Assertions by themselves are not sufficient grounds for us to accept them. They must be argued. This involves what kind of evidence would bear upon the truth or falsity of the issue under consideration. There also needs to be an assessment of the logical structure of each argument to determine whether the claimed conclusions really follow from the support offered for them. Whenever we, whenever we can treat, can critique a different view from our own, we must use valid objective criteria. There would seem to be two types, the criteria which a view sets for itself and the criteria which such views must meet. It is not a damaging criticism to point out, in effect, the difference between our view and another view. Much criticism virtually consists of the charge that A is different from B, that such a complaint is inconsequential unless one has already established that B is the correct view, or A can claims to be an instance of B. To draw an illustration from a totally different realm, suppose that a football team stresses offense. If the team wins a game by the score of 40 to 35, it would not be a valid criticism to point out the poor quality of the defense blah, 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 football. More will be said about the criteria of evaluating propositions and systems in the chapter on religious language. At this point, it will be sufficient to point out that criteria generally utilized are internal consistency and coherence of ideas, 
of sets of ideas and their ability to accurately describe and account for all the relevant factual data. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Godspeed.